I want you to take them and turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1. I shared this portion with uh, uh, Al and Dorothy, my brother-in-law and sister, as all of us sat around the table one morning. And uh, I just felt as though that we should maybe rehearse some things in our thinking because that's exactly what Second, Second Peter chapter 1 does. I want to read the first 14 verses. First 14 verses of Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and in so doing, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you having spiritual victory? I believe every Christian desires to have spiritual victory in their lives. Now, I uh, have become very convinced, as I was sharing with Tim on the way home last evening, that um, methodology does not necessarily have the key to the victorious Christian life. Nor is it getting the job done, I think, from the standpoint of a spiritual life. Now, I know that we have to do all things decently and in order, but I believe one of the prime ingredients to a spiritual victory in our lives is being left out or is being minimized. And if you want a passage of Scripture which will just simply tell you right straight from the shoulder the secret for a spiritual life that is a life of victory in the Lord, you've got it before you. Right here in these first 14 verses of Second Peter chapter 1. Now let's look at it. <coughs> Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and the virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it is fitting, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir up you by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Now, isn't it interesting that in this first chapter of Second Peter, you have some very definite, specific things mentioned 
<coughs> and you, uh, you'll notice that we have to commence at the right, pl right place. And then there's a cultivation of some spiritual graces that we must uh, be engaged in. And then a definite consequence. So just simply note that order. There's a proper place to begin. We've got to begin there. And having begun, then there is a practice, or we might call it a platform, a practice, and a product. Very simple. But it is an order that I believe must be adhered to in our Christian life. So you've got right the platform. Let's look at it. It is quite obvious that he is writing to Christians, because he speaks of beloved brethren over in the uh, uh, verse, four, uh, verse 10. He speaks about those of uh, uh, having forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. And he speaks of those in verse 1, having obtained like precious faith, and etc. So <coughs> you have as a beginning talking to believers. And in speaking to believers, he emphasizes something extremely important, I believe. Verses 3 and 4. According as his... Well, maybe we better go back to verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, when you come to this particular phrase, the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, he's talking more than just knowing about them, having an intellectual understanding. He's talking about a spiritual perception that has been wrought because of a spiritual relationship. Therefore, it is a believer's relationship you talk about the knowledge of the Lord and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ right here in this portion in this first chapter. Now then, observe. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. First of all, He reminds us of the grace of God that we might call sufficient grace of God for everything. I'm afraid that in my Christian life I have not fully comprehended this. Because there are many times that when I am confronted with problems or confronted with decisions, I will start to think, start to connive, start to make plans, start to say, all right, now where should I move in this regard? Wait a minute. As a believer, I'm informed in verse 3 that there is a provision by an omnipotent God by grace. I haven't earned it, but it is a provision that He has made, and it says, according to His divine power, now that's omnipotence, that's all-powerful, given unto us all things, not just a few things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. See what he's saying? There is a reservoir of the grace of God that is unlocked or available to us on the basis of the power of God that relates to everything for my Christian life. And not only for my Christian life, but that Christian life that is to manifest godliness. 
So I have a standard immediately established for me. The treasure house of God, on the basis of His ability, available to me for a life and a life of godliness. I don't think. I don't think we can claim this verse for all of our desires in life, all of our wants in life, because many times our wants and our desires do not fall within the category of a godly life, do they? You have in James, for instance, ye have not because you ask not, because you ask that you might have a thrust upon your carnal life. Now God is not in the business of establishing you and establishing me with a reservoir of His grace for carnality. He's not. Absolutely not. <clears throat> have you heard this excuse, as I have time and time again? Let me give you an illustration. Some years ago, there was an accident down here at this corner. I went down there. Two young people, two young people that had some relation here to this chapel. They had um, been drinking it up, and they'd wrecked down there. One boy was lying unconscious. He had hit a rock. The other boy was walking around. It was his cousin who was lying unconscious. And he was in somewhat of a, a state of anxiety. He wasn't in shock, but just anxiety. And um, I walked over to him and told him who I was. He knew who I was. And I said, listen, at this present time, in a real sense, we need to come to the Lord. Ah! None of that junk. What I need is I need some help. And God hasn't done anything like that. Look at Look at this. Blaming God for that which he'd already done. Eh? How many times have I approached people in even bereavement and they've blamed God for their state of bereavement? Now, God has promised for the believer to give all things for our life in godliness, in godliness. Now let's go on. This comes through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. In other words, it is by revelation, not by circumstance, but revelation. Now then, by virtue of this revelation, and actually, it's by which are given unto us what exceeding great and precious promises. Now, I don't know how much more God can do than to provide you and provide me with a resource of an abundant life in godliness, then giving us a revelation which is just marvelous here that by these great promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is a very interesting section. As I've been meditating upon it, this word uh, partaker in verse 4, let me just uh, share it with you. In order that ye might become koinonioi, you might be sharers, that you might have things in common of the divine nature. Now, how do I appropriate a life that's of the character and the caliber of deity? It isn't that I become God. But it is the very moment that I trust the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I am born again. I have that incorruptible seed. I have the new life. I have a new nature, which is of the character and caliber of God. Now, how do I get this? I do not get it through emotion. I do not get it through uh, intellectualism, but I get it by trusting in a message of revelation. Now listen, folks. This koinonia is not only a partaking of something, but it is a sharing in common. I have some things in common with God. You have some things in common with God. And that is this new life. Now, isn't that fantastic? That is beyond my comprehension. But <clears throat> I have a nature, a new life, a new nature, and anything else that you want to add to it which relates to the product of God that God and I can share in common. And the context is dealing with conduct. Christianity is not theoretical. Christianity is to be very practical in shoe leather. <clears throat> but believe me, it doesn't come, up, come about by some secret I've got. Some secret program or some secret uh, standard. It's wide open to everyone by the revelation, these wonderful promises of God. I become partaker of the divine nature and I have escaped I've been set free, jailbreak, if you please, liberated <clears throat> from a conduct of corruption that is in the world through lust. As I was lying in bed last evening thinking about this, who's the human author? <laughs> Peter. Did he have any difficulty? Man, I'll tell you, he was sticking his foot in his mouth all the time. <laughs> he saw the Lord walking on the water. Lord, if it's you, I, come on, let me come to you. Well, come on. <laughs> and he got out, and everything was just fine until he started looking at the water. And then, zoom, down he went. He didn't keep his eyes on the Lord, did he? And then... He rebuked the Lord with reference to his message. He was going to go to the cross. He's going to die. He said, oh, no. He said, I'll just go with you right all the way. Oh, Peter, you're going to deny, deny me three times before that rooster crows in the morning. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, <clears throat> he, had the greatest, he had the greatest show on earth. The trouble of it is he was transferred into another portion of the earth into the millennium glorified state there of the Lord with Moses and Elijah. And when the Lord came down, he says, oh, we need to build, we need to build three temples. We need, 
We need to really get at it and do something for you and for you. Oh, Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. He's the human author here. To escape corruption, to escape a life of this world, through the great message of the one who provides a divine nature for you and for me in the person of the Lord Jesus and that nature to be constantly sharing in common with my Father. We are not going to be sharing that kind of life when we walk in corruption. We're just absolutely not. It's a... Uh, he won't walk there. He won't be with us. He's going to let us do the walking, but he's not going to be alone. Now then, there's something that we can cultivate in this wonderful new life. Here is a provision that he has made for us. Now then, please notice the practice or that which we are to cultivate. I love these things because before long you're going to see a product. And oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful product. And beside this, giving all diligence. And right there is where we've got to stop. It says diligence, not apathy or apatheticness. It's diligence. Let me ask you a question. How diligent are we in the Christian life? How diligent are we now having what we do have? to enhance what we do have. How diligent. Do we uh, have as much concern for our spiritual life, for our spiritual walk, as we do for a walk that could lead us into corruption? Um, here is uh, inventory time. Giving diligence all delegates. Here is a statement from Scripture that is going to provide for you and provide for me either the success or the failure. And that's all there is to it. Depends on how diligent we are. Giving all diligence. Now do something. Add to your faith. Now, here's the key. I appropriate these things above by faith. I have believed the message. Therefore, I have this divine nature. I have believed what His Word said. Therefore, I have the faith that I can build on. And actually, from this point on, it's simply a building on faith. Here are the things which are going to have to be cultivated in our Christian life if our faith is going to mean anything to us from a practical point of view. Now, uh, in this verse, let me just point something out. Uh, supply it's not add to your faith, but it is supply, add in your faith. In the life of faith, now add to it the very first thing, which is compatible to godliness, and that is virtue. Um, he's talked about having escaped the corruption in the world through lust. 
now then, he said, you do something. I've made a provision. Now you sort of get in gear in your practice. And that practice is add in this faith a characteristic which you have a choice about. Um, conversation of recent weeks has revolved around some deplorable conditions of society. And I suppose one of the most deplorable conditions of society that is such a contrast to years ago, it might have been around, but it certainly wasn't publicized, but probably one of the most deplorable is the moral problem today. That moral problem, I forget, I think they were talking about it last night at the house. Um, is of such a nature that the law has accommodated itself to the encouragement of the immoral manner of living outside of the marriage bond. And in that relationship, there is the benefits, legally speaking, of the law. Bless the law. Don't forget something in Scripture, will you? The letter kills, but it's a spirit that gives life. Just because the law allows it doesn't mean it's right. Absolutely not. The Bible says, for a believer, the first thing that is to be added in the life of faith is purity. Purity. I'm afraid, and I know so, in light of some of the ministries that we've had this past two weeks in some of these areas, and the conversation with various ones, I know this is a desperate problem in churches today. It really is. It's a desperate problem. <clears throat> now, I don't want us to do something wrong. Would you remember that there's forgiveness? Would you remember that? And when there is forgiveness, there's no more remembrance. Now, I know various believers today, fine believers, often have a past life thrown up against them. Now, when that takes place, I don't want you to do it, <laughs> but you can do it just in thinking. Double up your fist and smack them in the nose. Don't do it physically. <laughs> because that, 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 just, that just isn't right. Because you just remember this. Hebrews chapter 10. Where there's forgiveness of sin. You hear it? Where there's forgiveness of sin, there's no more remembrance. The big problem isn't the past life of forgiveness. The big problem is the present condoning of it and making it a standard of life today. That's what's wrong. The Bible says, in your walk of faith, add in that walk of faith purity. And there is where you and I have the opportunity of making a choice. That the lust and the other things can be curtailed because we have chosen to do that. What happened to Joseph? Potiphar's wife. Surely, heart, there she was after him. But what did he do? He chose to run. And he did. 
Well, it cost him a little bit, but he made the choice of purity. He really did. And as a result, there was great blessing, wasn't it? All right, now then, it says, add in your faith virtue. And in virtue, <clears throat> now then, what does it say? Knowledge. Don't you love that? I do. Because your choice needs to be enhanced by something what he says. Aren't you encouraged when people will come along and say, My, I'm sure glad to see you doing this. Okay, that's doing what? That is understanding something that someone else is recognizing. To this walk of faith, and in your walk of faith, Make the choice for purity. You can do that. God has given you that ability to do that. Make the choice for purity. Now then, in making that choice for purity, come to a standard, if you please, that enhances it, that encourages it. I don't know if many things out there in that world is doing too much encouraging in life for the Lord. Do you? I don't. I just don't. But I sure am thankful that we as a group of people can gather together at Northland and we can learn from a love letter from glory things that encourage us <clears throat> to walk this life of liberty. Having been delivered to walk this life of liberty by faith in a walk that's constantly being encouraged for purity because he tells us how to do it. Come on in, folks. It's too rainy out there. Stand out there. <laughs> All right, listen. <clears throat> I think what I'll do is, since it's raining out there and we're just getting right on a, a, a few minutes, we'll... We'll continue on with this probably tonight. But I, I want to encourage you. Uh, the Lord has made a wonderful provision. Just a fantastic provision for us. Now then, he said, if you want to know the greatness of it, and if you want a great result of it, I'm just going to say, uh, read for you once again, verses 8 through 10. Will you watch this? What is going to be the benefit or the product of the practice on the basis of God's provision. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you to be what? Neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you want a fruitful life? Here it is. Now then, he that lacketh these things is blind. There's such a thing as a believer being blind. Can't see afar off. And then it affects the thinking. You have some doubts with reference to your Christian life at times? Well, it's probably because of the truth of the Word. He's forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It affects great big doubts. And verse 10, Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence. Spudazo again. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Get it settled. For if you do these things, what does it say? There's the greatest victory there is. Ye shall never, 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 ever fall. Isn't that wonderful? That's God's standard. You don't have to have someone come along and give you a great big hocus-pocus job of mysticism and everything else and say, if you just follow this, now you're going to be all right. Listen, I've got a guarantee. I've got a guarantee, surefire standard from the Word of God <clears throat> how I can keep from falling. There it is, dear folks. I will finish it this evening. 
Our Father, we want to thank you and praise you for this great, great provision from glory. We're thankful to be able to be back home with our loved ones again. You've been so good to allow it. We thank you for these ones.